Nothing like a little love interruption in the middle yeah, of your love message, is it? Right. You are my friends. You are my friends. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Nothing like a little slobber knocking at church. What's the service? Of, the church service is no slobber knocking. Right, we've, got, we've got slobber knocking tissues around here somewhere. There's a box and there's a box of things. So. So the first proof about of love is the first proof thing that love proves is that it exists. Colossians 1 and 13 says it this way. Uh, he has delivered us, raptured, translated us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. The whole atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven is charged with God's love. 2 Corinthians 10 and 5 says this. Uh, casting down every vain imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bring these strongholds into captivity. Every single one of them. Jesus said, if you obey my commandments, you love me. And my love is abiding in you. And you're abiding in my love. If you've had a thought that was unloving. If you've spoken a word that was unloving. If you've acted in a way that was unloving. You. Not God. Not the devil. You. Killed an opportunity. To experience the atmosphere of the kingdom of heaven. You robbed yourself of an experience in the love that God has for you. If you're not experiencing the kingdom of heaven on earth every day on a regular day by day, moment by moment existence, it's because you've not done the labor of love, which is to grab those thoughts that you think. Change those ways. Change what you say. Is it every other thought? Is it every other day? No, it's every thought. Every word. Every action of every day. I remember being really honest with some mentors of mine in, in the faith when I first became a Christian. and we We're on this basketball team and I said, guys, if this verse is saying I've got to take every thought I think and run it through the Bible, I quit. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Forget it. This is ridiculous. No wonder nobody's a Christian. Who would want to do that? They laughed. I mean, you know, they laughed. But, but I was an athlete, and I knew what it meant to beat my body. I knew what it meant to train. I knew what it meant to be disciplined. And guys, love is discipline. Love is work. Love is discipline, and love is work. And you know what? The difference in the life that God has for you Versus the life you are actually living. If they're not one and the same. It's the six inches between your ears. When you know that God loves you. Then you can start to filter your thinking. You can start to say. Well how do I bring into captivity every thought? Well I learned through my friends and help. That well, what that means is. Is you take everything you think. And be honest about it. Just look at it. Call it a spade. Call it what it is. If you hate this person, then you, you just, just you hate this person. Lay that out there. And say, now what about that thought, that train of thought, is not God's love? What about what I just said that does not measure the standard of God's love? What about what I just did that didn't coincide with the filter of the way Jesus acts? And say, oh, that was far below. That was far short. I, I was laughing before service about the P90X video. When I first attempted the P90X videos, uh, it was 2010, I was still living in Knoxville. And the, when, I, when I first started, it became P180. Then it became P360. Then it became P450. 
because I wasn't getting through it in 90 days. In fact, the first workout video I put in, which was an hour and a half long, it took me four days to get through the first hour and 15 minutes. When I hit pause, pause bit, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> and he was right there waiting on me when I, <laughs> you know, I hit play. He, was, he hadn't gone anywhere. Me, I'd been to the Pizza Hut. I, I, I'd been to the Marshmallow Bar. <laughs> I'd called on God a few times. I talked to my mom about it. And I hit play, and that guy was right there waiting on me. So, so when, when I got these videos, access to these videos again last night, it was 12 o'clock, it was midnight. But I knew, if I didn't start, I knew I was just going to lay him out. I knew, I just knew, just, I would not, I'll never do it. And I, and I hit play with fear and trembling. <laughs> but this was the overriding thought in my mind. You know, God loves me. And there's no fear in love. And all this is going to do is lengthen my life. It's going to cause me to be around longer. Share the word a little more. Love and go further than I would have gone. Why wouldn't God help me do this? Why wouldn't he see me through to completion? Which is an attribute of love. And do you know an amazing thing happened at about 1.30? I was facing the floor and sweat was dripping off my face. And I heard, we're done! That's it! And I looked up. I was like, I'm not even bleeding. I didn't call 911. Mom's still asleep. I didn't wake her up. It happened. All in one setting. I never hit stop one time. Brother Copeland said this, the greatest force in the universe is the love of God. The love of God, the power, the power of his love put me in that floor. The power of his love picked me up. The power of his love laid me down. The power of his love most definitely woke me up and walked me to the bathroom. What did I do? Why is it so hard to get to the bathroom this morning? Oh, wow. I did P90X at 1 a.m. in the morning. Oh, my gosh. Note to self. Change your workout time. Yeah. The love of God did that. Second thing that love proves is your sonship or your daughtership. Go with me to Hebrews 12 and 6. We, we don't like to always hear about this aspect of love, but it's true and it's there nonetheless. And it's for our protection. Hebrews 12 and 6, well, we'll just start in verse 5. It says, my son or my daughter. I want to make a point here. This has been through me like a river for all weeks now. And maybe this is in response, and I don't know much about it, but the Queen James Version of the Bible, I just saw it. I can imagine what it is. You know, the rain, anyway. The, the reason, the reason that you see son and the reason you see kings and priests instead of queens and priestesses is the he, is the Greek and the Hebrew wording of it. In the culture, okay, the old the, the, the firstborn son was the highest ranked person in the family. The reason it doesn't distinguish between male or female, son or daughter in these instances is because he's calling you the firstborn son, even though you're a female. In his mind, he's made you the firstborn son. So when you read this Bible, it sounds so dominantly masculine. He's complimenting you. He's saying, I see you as Jesus. I see you as a king. The queen is still the queen. The king is still the king. I see you as king. Don't want to be queen. Don't want to be priestess. Be king. Be priest. Be El Numero Uno. Alpha dog. <laughs> okay? Alright. So, Hebrews 12 and 5. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. 
If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, say all, all. then you are illegitimate and not sons. So the proof of God's love, even in his chastening, even in his correction, is that you're his. If you spend your life looking at the wicked, looking at the, 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 uh, those that cut corners, those that are always striking deals, those that are always getting ahead by, by doing something that's just shady, you're missing, you're, you're, you're not seeing correctly. He says you don't love because they deserve it. You don't forgive because they love, because they deserve it. You forgive so that you can see again. The reason that God doesn't do anything about them, it seems like, is because they're not His. They're not in covenant. It would be illegal for Him to deal with them as, as son when they're not His son to begin with. There is a misconception in the body of Christ that we're all the family of God. We're just all the brotherhood of man. You're not my brother if Jesus isn't your father. Here's what you can say to someone who wants to make us all brothers. God is definitely the creator of all humanity. But he is not the father of all humanity. Turn with me to John 8 and 44. A little off the notes here, but that's okay. What has that ever not happened? John 8, 44. This is Jesus talking to the pastors of his day if you will. And he says, you are of your father, the devil. You want to do the desires of your father. If you have two different fathers, you're not brothers. Amen. You're not all brothers to everybody. Some people, their daddy's the devil. That's just a child of the devil right there. You're probably right. The way they act, the way they do, yeah. They probably are an offspring of Satan. Yeah. Noah was different. Let me tell you about the power of God's love to keep and protect and preserve. Don't think that God could not have flooded this whole earth Noah included. Let the waters dry and pulled another Adam out of the ground. He could have done it. He's done it once. He could do it again. Mm -hmm. What does they say? The mom, Medea says, don't lie to me. I'll take you out make another one look just like you. Who, who said that? Somebody said that. Yeah. Sound like Medea. But Noah did what? Noah walked in love. And because Noah walked in love when no one else was walking in love, what happened? He was spared. He was spared. It might not look like it. They might be laughing for 40 years at you chopping down wood in your backyard building a boat. And it ain't never rained on the earth. Not just building a big old boat which would be cause enough to pause. What are they doing at FCI? What is that in the front yard? <laughs> The ocean's four miles that way, friend. What's that boat doing in your yard? But then it's never rained. That's what love will do. Then there's Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham and Lot. Then there's this thing called the church, which is the greatest ark of all. Mm -hmm. Luke 7, 47. Love is the proof of forgiveness. Luke 7 and 47. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. The proof of love is the way you forgive. If you don't realize what you've been forgiven, 
it'll be hard for you to forgive anyone of anything. But if you take a moment and you think back to the day, to the hour, to the moment you got born again, and you let that simmer, and let that sit with you for a while, and then start your day, you're going to have a whole different life experience than had you forgotten what all you've been forgiven. And we're called to live that way every day. Jesus said, if you obey my commands, you love me. James 1 and 22 says it this way. If a man looks in a mirror, walks away, and forgets what he looks like, he's just like somebody who has heard the Bible, but didn't do the Bible. Jesus said, be fishers of men. Can you remember the last time you went catching, not just fishing, but catching? Can you remember the last time you shared your testimony with anybody? Mm -hmm. If you can, you probably are walking in the love of God. If you can't, you might want to check your bulb. Check up on things. Check up on things. Because coming to church is great. But winning the lost and discipling people is the great commission. Now, takes a church to disciple. It really does. What are you going to do if it rains? You know, you need a roof. I mean, there's a practical part to it. Everybody cracks on the building. This building never hurt anybody. I'm going to take up for the building this morning. The building never hurt anybody. Stop talking about the building. We love our building. The church is not a building. What are you going to do if it rains? People in a building may have hurt you. Go to them and deal with them. Talk to them. But check up on you first. You know, what is that? Point the finger, there's four pointing back at you. Start right there. All right. Uh, Love is work. Love is work. Go to Galatians 5 and 6. My mom said this. I've I've quoted this so many times. I I hope she didn't have it copyright. I'm going to owe a bunch of money. Most people miss opportunity because it knocks at the door wearing overalls and looks a lot like work. Let me say it again. Quote mom. Most people miss opportunity because it knocks at your door wearing overalls and looks a lot like work. And love is work. Most people are missing everything about Christianity, everything that God has for them in life, because they're unwilling to unwilling to work. There's no way you could successfully pastor and navigate the life of a pastor if you aren't willing to work the labor of love. Someone visited and someone said, "Well, this one's this and that one's that," and I said, "So, <laughs> tell me something I don't know." I said, but I'm not going to confront and chase him all day long. I'm not going to do it. People are sinning. People are sinning in this congregation. And I know it. But I'm not going to. Every time I see you, I'm, I'm not coming to be God's lightning rod. <laughs> you know? It's not going to happen. It's different than evangelizing. It is. It is. Love covers a multitude of sins. I didn't say that love excuses. Love covers. And if you're sinning, stop. It's not complicated. Stop. That's what he said. Stop sinning. Come to yourselves and stop sinning. But don't put me in the position to have to confront you over everything. What I usually get is the cleanup. Pastor, I need prayer. (laughs) And what I want to do is let me tell you why you need prayer. You don't even have to tell me what you need prayer for. Just let me tell you why you need prayer. Because you're doing this, this, and this, and this. I, I, and, you know, so we're, we're going to pray, but what are we going to do about this? The thing that led to the prayer need. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. But faith that worketh by love. If you're believing God, if your faith is extended for things, and you're saying, man, I know the scriptures, I know the word, I've got my seed sown, but it's just stalled, and it's like, there's just like, there's a misfire. 
the first place that I would go is I would check up on my love walk. Because if you don't walk in love, it's going to affect your faith. In fact, you don't have faith if you don't have the presence of love. And love isn't always what we think it is. Love is what the Word says it is. Let me read you something. Love endures long and is kind. Well, <laughs> that's it right there. <laughs> well, all righty. Yeah. I ain't been in love in about a decade. <laughs> love is never envious nor boils over with jealousy. Love is not boastful or vainglorious. Love does not display itself haughtily. This is the amplified version of 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. It is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. Pride is a subtle form of fear, which is eradicated by mature love. You see someone prideful in your life, love them. It'll get rid of that. You've got to love pride out of people. Love them. It is not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. <coughs> Man. If you want to preach the message as a pastor, well, I've spent a year on that one. Everybody's got a vision. You're kings and priests. If you didn't have a, an opinion about this place, I'd be shocked. That's what leaders do, is have opinions about things. But you know what? You're going to have to not insist on your vision. You're going to have to not insist on your own way. Let the Lord have His way. Many are the plans of a man's heart, but the Lord draws out His. It's not touchy or fretful or resentful. God forbid I should speak a correcting word. Don't run off. Talk about me. The last person that did, I saw him at Home Depot the other day with their arm in a sling. I'm serious. I, I kid you not. Uh, someone the other, then another person did the same thing. Their mother fell and cracked her head wide open. They sent me a text. Please forgive me. I was thinking about this this morning when I got the report about my mother. We're good. It's cool. I ain't got... You don't want to go in a bed like that, huh? I go to sleep. I'm p 90 x it. I don't have time. To... I'm sweating when I go to bed. I'm looking for a breathing machine. I ain't thinking about you. It doesn't take into an account evil done to it. When's the last time someone just did you wrong? And your friends want to, your Christian friends are like, man, that is so wrong. Let me tell you why that's wrong. Let me give you scripture and verse. And the, on the Holy Spirit, the whole time is going. Don't take that into account. We don't have time for it. Come on, we got to go. Let's go higher. The devil's a liar. That's Let's go. Right. That's right. But you wanted to have a prayer meeting around how bad that thing was, how wrong they did you. You needed somebody to know. And I've done it. We've all done it. And the whole time, the Holy Ghost is going, save your breath. Let's go. Let's go higher. We don't have time for that. That's how love can get a whole lot done. You don't think in three and a half years, the way Jesus' family treated him, that he didn't want to sit down and just spray somebody? Have a drive-by at his own house? He's God. And they're doubting him. He's God. That's God talking. And the Bible says in John, his brothers didn't believe him. In fact, they were goading him to go to a place where they were already looking to kill him. There was a wanted poster on the wall, and his brothers were like, why don't you go up there if you want to show yourself to the world? Go up there. His brothers were setting him up to be killed. That's God talking. That's right. Never mind the fact that he hung on the cross because his family put him up there. He created them and they crucified him. And he didn't take into account what his last words. Father, forgive them. Lord, don't put that on their ledger. They don't know what they're doing. There's a real self-confidence boost in that. They treat you wrong. They lie about you. They talk about you. They don't know better. They really don't know. I know it's a shock. They don't know. How many times have I gone back to Knoxville and sat there, and all over the world people are like, I hope Pastor Eric will come minister to us. I wish we could get him here for a meeting. And I'm sitting in the living room. 
just trashed and dogged out, treated like some chump. And I'm sitting there thinking, they don't know. I could say one word and their whole life be different, and they don't know enough to ask. They don't. And just as soon as you can accept that, it's going to get a whole lot easier. A whole lot fewer fever blisters. A whole lot fewer uh, stuff in here, junk in here. A whole lot fewer ulcers and things. Maybe none at all if you can really get it figured out. Love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness. So listen, if you support homosexual marriage, don't rejoice. Because love doesn't. If you want people taking your guns away, don't rejoice. Because love doesn't. Because you need to be able to protect yourself. Yeah. From the very ones trying to take your guns. That's the whole reason you have a gun. That's why that was put in the Constitution. Because once they got your guns, you ain't doing nothing. I doubt seriously they'll pass that law in Tennessee and Kentucky. <laughs> Too much revenue. But rejoices when right and truth prevail. I heard a story, just a, an amazing story. I'm going to bring this up. Advanced Auto Parts, I think it's the store. An employee, this is a true story. Man walks into the auto parts store, holds him up at gunpoint. Puts a gun to the guy's head. One of the employees sneaks out, goes to his car, gets his Glock, walks up to the guy, puts the gun in his head, and says, drop the gun, I'm going to blow your brains over that wall right there. The robber drops his gun and the money, saves the day. They fired him. They fired him because they have an anti-gun policy. That's what's going on in your country today. He's a hero, celebrated everywhere as he goes, and he got fired. So that company is on the verge of a national boycott because of their politically correct position. Because of a few pansies, and I'm not talking about flowers you plant either. Love rejoices when right and truth prevail, even if it's not popular. Love bears up under anything. There's not one thing love won't bear you up under. Not one. And everything that comes. It's ever ready. Millionaires have this in common. They have a lot in common. They have one thing most outstandingly in common. Love, millionaires believe the best of everyone they meet. When's the last time? Excuse me. You saw somebody coming, and you already knew them, and you already knew everything you thought you knew about them, and when's the last time you said, I believe the best of them today? Today, the past is the past. Today, I believe the best of them. It takes work to walk like that. That ain't natural. That's supernatural. It endures Everything. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. There's not one circumstance that's going to come into your life that will cause your hope to diminish if you walk in love. We're, we're fixing to begin to close, wrapping this up. And it endures everything without weakening. If you're getting weak because of what you're enduring, you're not walking in love. You're not. And maybe the first thing you need to do is go love yourself. Take a time out. Take a chip, put them on pause. They'll be waiting when you come back. They might have changed, but you'll be different. Maybe you need to take yourself out. Go to the beach. Go to the mall. Go to a movie. Go to something. Get away. But now, if you're always like that, maybe you just need to stay. <laughs> you're always having to get away. Maybe you just need to stay. So there's a balance. Love never fails. And it says in the Amplified, it never fades out, becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. I looked it up in the dictionary because obsolete is a long word. It says it never goes out of date. Love is always cool. I might not know Jonte's culture, but if I walk in love, I can succeed in his generation. I, I hate to hear people say, well, I'm just older. 
preach to young people. I just say, I'm just, no, just walk in love. You'll never go out of date. You'll never go out of style. Walk in love. You, some of you are going to be promoted very soon, very soon. Some of you are going to be promoted. And you're going you're to walk into a room filled with people who are dressing nicer, talking higher, more cha-ching, and you're going to walk in and you feel like you're in a potato sack. <laughs> Dress to impress, please. Help me, Jesus. You know what? If you walk in love, all they'll see is the glory cloud. That's right. Be like Adam and Eve walking naked in the garden. All they'll see is the glory of God on you. That's all. Walk in love. <clears throat> Lastly, uh, love never fails. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13. You like some of us are trying to kill Goliath, and we need to just start with the lion and the bear. Little successes, little victories yield to bigger victories. Sometimes you need to just step back and maybe just pay the water bill instead of tackling the rent this month. Start where you are. Get a victory under your belt. We'll wrap it up with this. There's more, but we'll, we may have to come back to it. I played college basketball in North Carolina at a, at a school that had not had a winning season in probably since Jesus was here the first time. <laughs> you know they played basketball 2,000 years ago, did you? And the coach made this statement because we turned it by my sophomore year. We made the playoffs, the NCAA playoffs. It never happened. They're like, what? And we were just sophomores, so, you know, the future's looking bright. The year after I graduated, they won every game but one. He says, when I went recruiting you guys, I didn't just look for the best players I could find. I looked for the best players from the most successful programs. I wanted winners to come in here and change the climate of losing. Maybe it's time you start surrounding yourself with people who aren't the most flashy, but who are the most successful. <clears throat> their success at their Christianity. They maybe aren't known by everybody just yet, because cream will rise to the top. But you need to surround yourself with people that walk with God regularly, successfully, every day. You don't see them up one day, down the next. You need to find somebody who's winning and surround yourself with them and let that rub off on you and change that losing atmosphere inside of you. Change that climate of losing that goes on in your mind. Change it by changing the atmosphere around you. It might mean doing what Kelly did when she got saved. You might have to write some letters to some people. We can't hang no more. <laughs> No offense, but I'm gone. <laughs> change your number. Change your name. Change your way. Change, start making these changes. And get the losers out of your life. And get the winners. All right? Let's pray.